as the sun sets on Easter week, you have to, if you've been keeping up with the story, take a moment, inhale deeply, catch up with yourself and reflect on what just happened. Seven days ago, we were on the outskirts of the city watching Jesus ride in on a donkey, being hailed as king by the whole city. Over the next few days, he has a, a fight in a temple. He kicks out all of the system. He destroys the symbols of the system. He says that the system is done with and that God is now accessible by all freely, not just those good enough or who think themselves good enough to walk through these particular hoops. He has meals which are intimate and kind and generous and revolve around hospitality and service and yet they're interrupted by bizarre acts of love and worship where people adore Jesus and waste oil and ointment on him in lavish acts of praise. They're also interrupted by uh, betrayal and deception and by friends walking out the door to sell information about where Jesus is and how he can be captured to people who do come and capture him, people who then take him to a court, people who then nail him to a cross, he's then put into a tomb, then there's this empty void of nothing. And then, early this morning, realizing that because of the rush of Friday, Jesus was not afforded the dignity of the proper burial that he should have been or that his followers would like to have given him, some women rise early in the morning and they get some ointments and some spices and some balms and they take those to the tomb where they laid Jesus just a few hours ago, ready to prepare him more, to give him this dignified burial that he should be given. Only when they get there, the tomb is empty. There's all this confusion, as there would be. Well, well where's the body gone? What's happened? Some of them rush off, figuring something has happened, and they, they rush back to where the other disciples were. Now remember, there were 12 disciples. One of them betrayed Jesus, so that's knocked it down to 11. Of the 11 remaining disciples, two believe the women that the tomb is empty, and they rush off after them to see for themselves what is going on. And they're going to discover an angel and have a conversation with this angelic body that describes the fact that Jesus has gone, and there's no point looking for him here anymore. One of the other women weeping in confusion and frustration and grief, stays near the tomb in this garden area. As she's wandering around through the plants, lost in this own whirlwind of what is happening, she bumps into this man. I mean, who are you going to bump into in a garden early in the morning? It can only be the gardener doing the weeding before the midday sun makes it too hot to work outside. And she bumps into this man and as she begins to apologize, she realizes, well, if he's the gardener, maybe he's been here the whole time. Maybe he saw something. Maybe he did something. Have you taken him? She says to the man. The man says her name back to her in a voice that she recognizes. Hold on a minute. That voice sounds like Jesus, but it can't be because he doesn't breathe anymore. She thinks as she takes a second look at the man standing before her and breathing. Who knows what just happened? It wasn't what anybody was expecting. Nobody on Friday or Saturday had it conceivably in their minds that Jesus might do this, but he did. And he did it in a typically Jesus way. He did it quietly. He did it unexpectedly. He spoke first to the women who nobody in the society was expecting to be the first to get any good news. And then he disappears again for a bit. Imagine Sunday evening, you're sat down reflecting on all that you've just seen over the last week, trying to catch up with yourselves. You don't know how to feel anymore. But you do know that you've had some news, some news which flips Saturday on its head. It turns out because on Friday and Saturday, you thought darkness had won over light. On Friday, you thought that hope had been killed, that justice would never win, that 
fairness or rightness would never be restored. That God, it turns out, was not nearly as powerful as you'd hoped and would not come rescue the children of earth. And on Sunday, you get some news that says maybe light beats darkness. Maybe love does win every time. Maybe grace is more powerful than injustice. Maybe right is more powerful than wrong. Maybe the beauty of the garden will always overcome the oppression of the system. Maybe the gardener that breathes and appears in different places to different people and whispers their name to them is the restorer of all good things and is worthy of worship. What does that all mean? I don't know, but I'm looking forward to Monday now.